Hello and welcome to another Anarchism Research Group video. Today we're speaking to Colleen Morgan, lecturer in Digital Archaeology and Heritage at the University of York. Don't forget to subscribe, like and share this video. My name is Colleen Morgan. I am a lecturer in Digital Archaeology and Heritage at the University of York Department of Archaeology. And my work is primarily within what's called digital archaeology, but I've become very interested in anarchist theory and anarchist approaches to archaeology in the past. The social and economic struggle. A social philosophy which. Archaeology has long been the study of material culture and tried to, trying to derive understanding of the past from material culture. Increasingly, people have been using it today to understand contemporary archaeology and contemporary problems within the world. There are several examples around the world, including people using archaeology on plastics. I, with my colleague Sarah Perry, we excavated a hard drive and so trying to understand the materiality of the hard drive and what that can tell us about the manufacturing process and our understanding of space and place within a digital and physical object. So archaeology brings together material culture, which is what you think of generally when you think of archaeology as artifacts and pottery and things like that. But we also look at sites more generally, so that would be buildings, and we also look at landscapes as well. And sometimes we don't actually excavate, we look and um, try to identify archaeological remains from the landscape. So that's kind of a broad view of what archaeology is and what it can do, but there are many examples of archaeology being used to try to uncover histories and um, stories more of, that we wouldn't understand from written history because most of history is, has not been written down. And so I'm particularly interested in those bits that don't necessarily have a written component to it, but that you are able to discern from the material record. So most recently, I was excavating in Qatar, and this was a project called the Origins of Doha and Qatar Project with Professor Robert Carter. And this was excavating a series of pearling villages all up and down the coast of Qatar. I was very interested in how people managed to live in what was we would consider a fairly marginal way of living. Um, there was very little fresh water and a lot of the um, food was quite limited as well. So trying to understand how people were able to survive and even thrive in these coastal communities um, was a really important part of our research. But it was also really interesting because a lot of these communities have very clear connections to the present day. And so we we're able to incorporate oral histories and some documentary evidence um, to better understand the past in that case. The social and I became interested in anarchism and anarchism in archaeology, specifically through a moment, I believe, in sitting in um, my lounge with um, James Flexner, who is a close colleague of mine, and who explained to me um, that he believed that all archaeologists were anarchists. And I was not. I didn't know what he was talking about. I was shocked. Um, but I've increasingly come around to the belief that there are many anarchic aspects to archaeology and that um, anarchism can be a really, really effective tool to understand um, societies in the past and is a very different lens to actually understanding these societies because traditionally we think about um, in archaeology as change, as juncture, as disjuncture. We have some very evolutionary um, patterns of thinking about societies as far as you evolve to become a state society. But many societies resisted this, and so seeing those, um, that resistance, seeing those erasures, has become really important, I believe, in archaeology. To my mind, uh, within archaeology, and there are many people that are much more versed in this than I am, um, that it really came to be out of several different genres of archaeological thinking. Um, notably, there's Carol Crumley's work on heterarchies, and some of that fed into um, trying to understand and use some anarchist literature. I think that David Graeber was a really great bridge for a lot of archaeologists, and he was beginning to tell us stories that we didn't necessarily 
always agree with, but did have some resonance as far as um, understanding debt. And I think we also pulled some from the anarchist anthropologists um, clusters and, and what li- whatnot. But really, uh, within archaeology, um, a lot of the publications came really post-2012, and then there was an Emerin seminar, which I sadly wasn't able to go to because I had a child, um, but was really productive in forming um, the Black Trow Collective, um, who have put out a manifesto that's really fantastic. Um, about the utility and the hope and the generative qualities of anarchist thought in archaeology. Anarchism, the social and economic struggle, I think more generally within archaeology we see a lot of work within three genres. Um, We see people trying to use anarchist theory to better understand past and and resistance and um, past societies and structure and power and how that worked. But also you see it quite a bit in um, contemporary archaeology where people are doing archaeologies of um, again of current political movements of resistance and there's also um, finally in using archaeology um, as a prefigurative um, tool, so trying to bring people together through archaeology to prefigure an idea about how we want to live and work together in the future. I co-authored a paper about how archaeology could be understood um, as anarcho-syndicalism and be used as, um, a, again, a prefigurative device within archaeology in 2018 with Daniel Eddisford. And we looked at the history of the um, what is now the Museum of London Archaeology and what was then the Department of Urban Archaeology. And we found such a rich and interesting archive. Um, we found that they were creating zines and they were um, marching together and there's a lot more political action within archaeology at that time and we found um, whereas academic archaeology was very highly structured as uh, Mortimer Wheeler, a famous archaeologist says, it was run like a military campaign. These commercial archaeologists were often getting together and trying to understand and form a um, collective understanding of the past. And uh, Daniel Edisford and I looked at a very large, what's called a Harris matrix um, within archaeology, and that's how we document um, what we find on site and make it legible to others, and how we show the positioning of different things that we find on site. Um, and so. Um, We found within it this remarkable document that showed erasures, it showed whiteouts, it showed people changing their minds, um, and we could tell that it was the work of many, many hands. And so to me, that was very evocative to show um, this collective knowledge generation. And the really great thing um, was that when we turned it over, we found a flyer for political action on the back as well. And so it was in this way that we were able to discern within uh, commercial archaeology an ethic of care and how it is played out through health and safety, um, especially on site, and how um, people use, while it is commonly derided by many sectors, um, they really use it to try to take care of each other within a very dangerous um, atmosphere. But also I can see um, that the outputs of these um, publications were again very different. Um, there was Hobley's Heroes, um, which was a zine that came out and it's archived online, that had um, uh, comics, it had uh, things about the archaeology, it had gossip, and it was just this very free form, very interesting form of publication that we aren't really able to see even with the online world. I found it really inspirational and I hope to um, carry that forward in some of my work. So it's really interesting um, because anarchism in archaeology is a very broad church. You find people doing projects all over um, many different continents. You find um, Louis Bork's work down in the American Southwest and you find Bill Angelbeck. um, he, He works up in the Pacific Northwest, so those are both in America. Or James Flexner's work down in the South Pacific, and he looks at more colonial encounters. And so you're really seeing people that are looking at it um, all the way really from, I believe, the Bronze Age 
into almost the modern day. Well, I would say the modern day because you do have archaeologists looking at um, collections from um, utopian communities and resistance and things like that. So, my hunting ground of thirty-five years. Hunting ground. Hunting ground. I decided to devote myself to the. I don't think I can really speak for all of the anarchist archaeologists, and I certainly can't necessarily speak for the Black Trout Collective and some of their manifesto. Um, I think, though, that you can draw a lot of threads together out of what um, anarchists thought within archaeology can do and should do. I think that, like I said earlier, it was um, looking at prehistoric and historic societies to better understand um, structure or lack of structure or egalitarianism. I think it is um, looking at the material culture of current protest cultures, as I said, and I also believe that it is trying to bring together archaeologies of therapy, therapy to foment um, societies and um, make places where we want to live and work again. When I talk about prefiguration in archaeology, I'm really talking about the things that make archaeology meaningful to me, not necessarily to all archaeologists, but I find that when you come together and you make things together, and this can be not only the craft of excavation, but it can also be making interpretations. Um, a lot of our archaeologists do experimental archaeology, so they come together, they go outside, and they burn things together. And so, but um, really coming together towards a common goal working together in a very egalitarian way and bringing in people that don't necessarily um, have as much experience as, as you do, but also really valuing them and really um, trying to upskill them. But I think that folds really easily into ideas about authority within archaeology. Um, we've been struggling a lot with authority within archaeology. Um, for many reasons, um, and many prescribe a move away from authority and into what some people call multivocality. And so trying to draw together more interpretations and more people into creating um, these archaeological interpretations. And I think there's some really interesting um, things that can come from that. Um, but it really comes into the ideas um, of natural authority and artificial authority. So. Um, these more generally are um, artificial authority is, say, a, a politician or a, um, an academic who has um, some power that is not necessarily, uh, that is gained through a structure versus a um, natural authority which comes from intensive and repeated experience. And I think this is particularly pertinent to archaeology because they, they often the um, example used for natural authority is that of a shoemaker, right? So um, you want a very experienced shoemaker to make your shoes. And so you want a very experienced archaeologist to perform your excavation. But that doesn't mean that you're necessarily taking authority away from other people. Um, other people can come in and they might have authority in different ways. They might be a master videographer. They might have an amazing oral history of what is there. And there's no, necess there's no barriers necessarily to becoming and skilled within archaeology. But I think it's really important to recognize that there is a natural authority within the craft of archaeology. I think that anarchism can be really useful in um, critiquing a lot of the really statist models. And so um, understanding complexity as hierarchy, as greater structuration, um, versus um, a network, and so a network understanding of people and things together. I think that anarchist theory has been really well used by many archaeologists um, already. So you, again, you have Lewis Fork that is working in the American Southwest, in New Mexico, and really trying to understand um, culture and the perpetuation of culture, when really in archaeology we look for rupture and we look for change. And so I think that anarchist theory can really um, presence those absence, absences and make them relevant and make them very interesting and make them something to look for. Um, similar to that, I believe that um, Wengro and Raber's article on California and how some of writ large indigenous Californians 
um, saw themselves in arguably um, contrast to peoples of the Pacific North Northwest who were very much into um, potlatch and um, uh, they had other other things like slavery and um, so they constructed themselves in opposition to that in a fairly ascetic way. This is their research, and so I'm, I'm probably mischaracterizing it. But I do want to highlight that research because it is really important in um, showing how useful anarchist theory can be to archaeology. I think there's a lot of really exciting research coming up right now um, through ideas about radicalism and anarchism in archaeology. Caitlin Kitchener's work on Peterloo and gender is fantastic. Um, Kirsty Ryder is also very interested in um, what the material culture of the suffrage could possibly mean and how people used it to perform the radicalism. And I also believe that Ida Keiko's work in trying to understand communities um, Kurdish communities in London and their materiality and their ways of banding together is just incredibly vital and incredibly important to highlight. My hunting ground of 35 years, hunting ground, hunting ground, I decided to devote myself to the presentation of anarchism, the social and